So today I'm going to be taking a look at the AP Royal Oak 16202. This was a watch that I borrowed from a friend, so just keep that in mind. Uh, I did have it for about a week or so, so it was one of my first kind of more hands-on extended periods of time handling an AP Royal Oak, and this model in particular was interesting. So. Let's take a closer look. So we have a diameter of 38.5. The case has a lug to lug of about 48.6. If you take it where the bracelet stops bowing out, it's essentially like 57.4. We have a very nice thinness of eight millimeters. And lastly, the bracelet starts at around 26 millimeters, but it is integrated, so it doesn't matter too much. Some other general specifications for the watch, we're gonna have the caliber 7121 movement from AP beating away in there. Very nicely decorated, and we'll take a closer look at that later. We do have sapphire crystal on the back, sapphire crystal on the front. We have a state of water resistance of 50 meters with a regular push-pull crown. I believe the exact verbiage on AP's website is an anti-glare crystal, so there is some kind of anti-reflective treatment on the crystal. It doesn't uh, attract reflections super harshly, but of course you're just gonna have some reflections here and there, but it seems like a pretty good application. And if you are able to grab one of these at retail, the suggested price is $34,900. So starting off with the dial here, and this is very classic to AP, we have their tapestry style dial. This one is uh, held for only a very few select AP models, and this being one of them. The graining of the squares on the dial is a little bit tighter. There are more of them than the traditional uh, tapestry dial. I somewhat prefer the traditional one because I do like kind of uh, larger, more prevalent textures and patterns and just uh, details on the dial. But here it is a little bit more fine, a little intricate, and you can argue maybe a little bit more classy. The layout itself is all very balanced and very classical for the Royal Oak. We do have the hands and the markers all done in a baton styling, and they are also done in gold, as well as the AP logo down here and the screws on the bezel all done in gold as well. The hands and indices are also applied with loom in the very middle. It doesn't say what type of loom they use. I believe it's some kind of in-house loom, uh, and it does glow fairly well. Text is kept very minimally. We just have Audemars Piguet and automatic right here at the 12 o'clock, and then the AP logo here at 6. It's a little bit of an odd thing to see because I don't see many brands doing a logo at 6 o'clock. But it does balance out the dial pretty nicely, so I can't complain too much. And then lastly, very small at the 6 o'clock, we do have Swiss made there on the dial. This is, at the end of the day, the very much uh, sought-after blue dial Royal Oak. And it, to me, it is a very interesting blue dial, and not one I would necessarily have thought is the uh, you know, most sought-after tone, in a sense. It is very much a steely, kind of bluish gray. Uh, depending on the lighting, it can be almost very darkish, blackish, uh, maybe even midnight blue, I guess you could say. Uh, but I would have uh, been interested to see a little bit more saturation, a little bit more of a vibrant color tone, and you know, maybe they will do more of that in the future, but as it is executed here, it is a very classical color, very safe color, uh, but to me, maybe at times a little bit boring. Because of that tapestry dial at certain angles, you do have this somewhat three-dimensional pattern that pops out at you. Well, it's not somewhat three-dimensional, it is, but it's more of a, I guess you can say, illusion of the way the lathe has cut into the dial itself you can see some of the pattern moving, in a sense, as you move the watch around. So it is a interestingly dynamic dial, as long as you look out for that detail and you look a little bit closer. Uh, but on like face value, when you're wearing it on wrist, you're not gonna notice it overly much, but it is a cool point. The date disc here is done in a bluish black type of color. It's not like a full deep black, but it's also not an actual blue perfectly matched to the dial. It is a somewhere in between and it does function nicely. It doesn't stand out too much, but it also doesn't blend in overly. So the date wheel is executed fairly nicely and really no complaints there. As far as the dial goes, there's really not much to say. It is clean, it's classic, and I think uh, on further magnification, it'll shine a little bit more. So taking a look at the watch in more natural shaded light, this does go very dark, very kind of almost deep bluish black, depending on the angle, depending on how much light it's actually hitting the dial. And the texture does kind of disappear unless you look very closely. So it does look good. Of course, the bracelet's pretty much shining a lot more than the watch head itself is, uh, but that is the Royal Oak for you. It does look good. It does take on a nice monotone color, but you don't get a lot of color depth in the shade. Looking in direct sunlight, however, you do get a little bit more of that sunburst pattern coming out. You can actually see the dial texture and uh, the tapestry a lot more. Uh, you also get that color shift from a deepish bright blue to more of a grayish uh, steely blue. It does have a lot of dynamicism in direct light and the fact that it does change so much from shade to direct light is very fun. So taking a look up close you can see a little bit more here that the hands and indices do have a little bit more of that white gold luster to them. They're not quite as shiny bright as stainless steel. They have a little bit of a warmer tone to them and it is nice. You can see the Audemars Piguet text is just put right over the pattern itself and thankfully it comes to life on wrist. It's not being uh, 
I guess you can say pimpled or not being three-dimensional for the logo. It just does look like a very plain white text. And it's well executed. It doesn't look uh, sloppy in a sense where I think if they had applied too thin of a logo print to it, it could have possibly looked that way, but it is executed well. You can see at this magnification too, the loom signature does mismatch a little bit from the whiteness of the text itself. It is like that with most looms. It's not something I really have noticed while wearing it, especially since the loom uh, infill is very thin and very fine. So most lights, it does look almost purish white, so it's actually not that big of a negative. You get the pattern itself, and this is where the intricacy of the dial comes to life a little bit more. Uh, you can see there is like a little bit of like a pebbled uh, dotted pattern as the base dial texture, and then you have all these squares, which have a unique shape to them. They're not just like flat, square, one-dimensional. They have a little bit of a turning down on each side, a little bit of a roundness to them. And you have this uh, softly circular pattern going all throughout the dial and consistently and continuously through each one of those square islands, I guess you can say. It is a very intricate pattern. It's very nice to see. And to me, at least unfortunately, it's not something you can really notice from wrist. Of course, it's something that you can appreciate uh, in its fine details, but it would be nice for them, I think, to come out with a model that adapts it in a way which still keeps the ties to the stylistic design and heritage, but makes it much more visible and much more noticeable. Uh, because I think it's just nice to be able to appreciate it without having to have a loop on you 24-7. Looking at the AP logo here at 6 o'clock, you can see it isn't really three-dimensional, or at least it's not multifaceted. It is raised up off the dial itself, which is nice, but uh, there isn't a lot of light play uh, from faceting going on. It is a one-dimensional uh, flat-topped thing. It would have been nice to have a little bit of cutting or a little bit of englage uh, added on to this uh, little logo here. It would have made it feel a little bit more premium, but as it stands, it's not bad. You, of course, do have a little bit of blasting there between the letters, and then you can see there is a little bit of a speck there on the end of the bridge of the A, and then maybe a little bit of speckling slash scratching on that P there. So uh, definitely unfortunate to see at this price point a watch, but all watches have QC issues, and at least as this go, it's a little bit minor, but still unfortunate. Looking at the indices themselves, these are, I think, more interesting because, again, they are more rounded. They're more of a soft shape. There is no necessarily flat top surface. And because of that, they catch the light really nicely. They disperse it very interestingly. And it just gives you a feel of something that's uh, not plain, not commonplace in a sense. It just does look really nice and react with the light nicely. And I do just really like how it's executed here. You can also see the index kind of just comes up and wraps around the lumen fill. So it does rise up a little bit more than the lumen fill itself, giving a little bit of three dimensionality. Although it's not super noticeable from wrist, it does come together to create a nice just visual appearance for the uh, dial itself. Looking at the hand stack, you can see the top part of the minute's hand has a little bit of scratching there. Again, unfortunate to see, especially at this price point, but the rest of the hand isn't too badly done. The hour hand, again, a little bit of a speck there towards the middle bulbous part. But again, just like the indices, it has a beautiful rounded shape to the entire hand, especially even at the base of the hand. So I really love the shape that they went with here. I really like how it comes together. Uh, these small little QC issues are unfortunate to see, especially here, like on the minute hand, you can see that tiny little speck. So it isn't perfectly done, but white gold is a little softer. So it is slightly forgiven, and especially since this is nothing you'll see from wrist view, but it would have been nice if it wasn't there at all. Looking at the date window, you can see what I mean by saying it's a bluish blackish type of date wheel. It's not completely deep black, uh, and it's almost like charcoaly black, steely blue. So it does tie in well with the dial itself. Again, it doesn't contrast too much, but it also doesn't blend in too much. So it's a nice happy medium. I think the date wheel itself is done nicely and there's a very nice kind of uh, angling that leads down from the dial to the window itself. Overall, it's a really well done dial. Again, the texture is very fine, very nice, very intricate, but maybe a little on the small side for my personal preference. Obviously, it's not badly done. You do have a lot of color depth depending on the angle and it is just a classic AP dial. I would have expected the QC to be a little bit better at the price point, especially since this is, uh, you know, quote unquote, one of the holy trinity of watchmaking. But as it stands, at least there's nothing super glaring. So taking a look at the case here, and this is what makes it a Royal Oak. This is what the iconic status is kind of all about. Uh, it is a very nicely constructed case. It is very surprisingly shiny, surprisingly blingy for a watch that is mostly brushed. As I mentioned, we have primarily brushing on this watch. We have vertical brushing here on the top side of the bezel, but on the sloped part, we have fully high polish, which contrasts and uh, just looks very good on the watch itself, a nice little point of interest. Really on the top side, we have pretty much vertical brushing everywhere. We have the vertical brushing that leads from the bezel onto the case and into the bracelet. It's really cohesive and just looks very premium.
On the case side, however, we do have horizontal brushing, a little breakup in the patterning, which isn't too bad. Again, it, it kind of is following the same idea of the bracelet or the watch itself expands this way, so the brushing follows that, and then on the side, the bracelet or watch expands this way, so it follows that. It's interesting that they don't follow the horizontal brushing onto the links here. They do go back to a vertical brushing. I think maybe if they would have gone with a horizontal, it would have been a little bit more of a cohesive touch, a little bit more of a, a consistent finish profile, but as it stands, it's not badly done. It's honestly something most people won't notice anyway. You can see here in the lugs, we do have screws that hold the bracelet in place. You're not going to really be changing this bracelet out for anything, so it doesn't matter much, but at least it is very sturdily held in place. Of course, you have the hexagonal bolted uh, AP logo here, which is nicely done. Just taking a second to appreciate this bracelet. Uh, again, for a pattern that is brushed, it has an immense amount of light play, it has an immense amount of depth, and it actually has an immense amount of finishing into it, uh, despite it looking fully brushed at first in a sense. You do have this very beautiful high polished contour along the edge sides of the bracelets here, which really just beautifully leads your eye in visually to the end of the bracelet and makes you really pay attention to the taper itself. At the very end, and again both ends, of this tiny little, I guess you can say, tic-tac uh, shape holding the bracelet links together, it is also high polished. So you have as you move the bracelet, as you move your wrist, you have these areas of high polish, you have these areas of brushing that really play together and play off of each other. And again, it is just a very fluid, very living looking material that is very beautiful in person. It is a you know quote unquote work of art and is deserving of its iconic status for sure. It goes from around 26 millimeters here at the top of the bracelet to 16 at the bottom, a 10 millimeter taper, which is pretty insane. But what I do love about it is that it is relatively a soft taper it isn't super quick it does take a good couple links for it to actually come down to its uh, smallest point so it is executed well moving on to the clasp here we have a push button butterfly deployant uh, you have to close one side first and then the other latches over it and then you have the AP square logo there in the clasp which is really nicely done I like the squareness of it it ties in with the angularity and the harshness of the watch itself it was it was like a circular motif in the clasp it wouldn't have paired as well unfortunately you do not have micro adjust anywhere and also I believe you don't even have different size links as far as I can tell all the links are the same size so you better hope it fits you nicely the links themselves are very thin and Although, if you look on this side, it seems as if we have screw links. If I actually bring in the link profile here, you'll see that it is interesting because this is the bar holding the watch together. It's just like a little bit bar that is slightly thinner at the end, and that's what slots in to this more rounded part of the end of the bracelet. And then you actually just have this very, very tiny screw, and that is what is the screwed part of the bracelet. So to me, it's not really a screw link bracelet. It's like a screw with a pin in it. Uh, I don't know if that's more sturdy. I don't know if that allows it to be thinner. I don't really know what the purpose is of it. But uh, it's an odd bracelet link style that I haven't seen before. And, uh, you know, take it for what you will. You could also see there is a little bit of a rigidness to this design. Uh, I don't think there's really going to be any wrist shape out there where it doesn't necessarily sit comfortably on unless you just go too small. Of course, if this watch is way too big for you, it just won't conform correctly and look a little bit odd. But outside of that, you know, it should conform pretty well. It is very soft on the underside, uh, but unfortunately I would say the edge of the links aren't as rounded as they could be. They're a little bit, not rough, but there's just a little bit more of a harsh edge than I think there should be just in terms of actual comfort. Does it fit stylistically with the watch and the harsh design? Yes. But do I think they should very much round the bottom edges of this bracelet because you one, can't see it from the top and it wouldn't ruin the design and two, it actually would improve the wearing comfort? Yes, I think they should. I wanted to zoom in here quickly on the bezel of the watch itself because again, this is a hand brushed watch. The brushing is done nicely, but there are certain angles where the metal has like a weird appearance to it. Like right there, you can see towards the edge uh, near the bezel, it has this kind of bundled up, uh, almost rough look to the metal. I don't know if that's a metal defect. I don't know if that's just a byproduct of the brushing. I don't know if it's that they're not using a good enough grit of you know, sandpaper or whatever they're using to brush this bezel with. It's just one of those things where at certain angles, the lighting can kind of turn and give a weird appearance to the metal, give like a very black defined line that comes in and out. And 
at sometimes it can feel almost unrefined, unfinished, or not polished to the extent that it should be. There the brushing looks very cool, very defined, three-dimensional. Interesting because you have those dark and light lines battling against each other. But again, there are just some angles where you get this weird, almost distortion in the metal that's actually kind of hard to bring up. Again, like this angle here where it just looks a little bit odd, a little bit less refined than I think it should. So that's just something to keep in mind. There are areas of this brushing where it looks a little bit rougher than I think uh, the watch should. But as a watch itself, it is a little bit of a brutalistic design. So maybe if it was a too quote unquote perfect brushing, it would have maybe uh, been at odds with the design a little bit. And of course, just zooming in here, these screws are pretty lovely. Of course, they're not really functional screws. They're more bolts, put it into the dial. Of course, all lined up perfectly to surround the bezel itself. But you can see they will get quite dirty, quite worn because they are white gold and they are softer. Taking a look at the watch caliber here, it is what you would expect from a luxury watch caliber. There is a lot of finishing on it. It just does look premium. And there is something about it that just feels better than you would almost expect it to be. What I do really like here is we do have bridges or at least more defined stability bridges for both the mainspring barrel as well as the balance wheel. And not only do they offset each other very nicely and just add a nice bit of symmetry, but the color they went for with this more gold tone also just adds a nice pop of color to the movement that I think is really well done. You of course have very fine brushing everywhere. You have the striping on the movement itself, very cleanly done. There really aren't any imperfections that I can see. Of course you have the unglage on the edge of the bridges and just every kind of edge that you can see on this watch. It is a very premium looking movement, nicely finished. And for this model year in particular, the 50th anniversary of the Royal Oak, you have the special 50th anniversary rotor that is actually really well finished. It has a nice customization. The 50 is very three dimensional and pops out pretty nicely against the watch and just the rotor itself. And of course you do have the vertical brushing here as well that I just think ties in very nicely and contrast well against the more high polished Audemars Piguet 50 years and just the other accents of this little rotor here. Zooming out a little bit, this is what the movement looks like on the day-to-day. -day. You just have the serial here and Royal Oak at the very top there. You have minimal text and really nothing uh, to write home about. What is interesting, I think, is of course the back screws are what hold the watch together and clearly they're functional because they don't line up perfectly like a, the bezel of the Royal Oak, but they are actually very fairly in line with each other. I don't know if this is just a uh, happenstance of this watch itself or they do try to do that but as it stands of course it's not perfect but it looks pretty cohesive and nicely done and again from this point of view the movement does really have a beautiful luster about it it's very bright those little gold accents pop really nicely and just give a very unique visual point of interest to focus in on and i think again the symmetry is very beautifully done here and thankfully going forward from this model year, you just do have these nice little improvements in the movement. We now have a 55 hour power reserve. It's now at a more modern four Hertz beat rate. Uh, you do have a quick set date now, which is kind of insane to say that took this long to get a quick set date into this watch. Uh, but you know, as it stands, it's a very nicely done movement and I think it pairs well with the rest of the watch. And then one last thing before we move on, I do love how the amount of screws and the positioning mirrors perfectly with the bezel. Of course, they're not functionally exactly the same since these are useful and the bezel ones aren't, but it is a nice touch, a nice little attention to detail because, you know, they didn't necessarily have to use the same amount of screws in the back. They could have just used like four bolted at each corner or something like that. But of course, it is much more of a tie to uh, symmetry and tie to just consistency. So moving on to how this watch wears, earlier I was wearing my Seiko here, and just for reference, this is a 40 millimeter watch. And here we have the Royal Oak sitting on my six and a half inch wrist. And while for my personal taste and personal preference, I do think the watch is a little bit too large, it doesn't not fit, <laughs> in, in saying that in a weird way, but it does, you know, quote unquote, relatively fit, especially if we go from more of like a side view, it is very thin. The watch itself actually doesn't overhang the edge of my wrist, at least for the true case itself. Uh, but to me, especially with this size of Royal Oak, the 39 millimeter, and especially the 41, what happens is because the bracelet itself is so thick at the ends, because it doesn't taper until a little bit further down the bracelet, the top head of the watch ends up wearing very much like a bracelet instead of a watch, like a bangle, like just something that is more jewelry than watch itself. It's very thick, it's very prominent, and it looks good if you have the thicker wrist to accommodate it, but on my smaller six and a half inch wrist, uh, personally, the best size I prefer is the 37 millimeter. I think it looks a lot more at home on my wrist size. But that being said, if you just love the 39, you can pull it off. And to be fair, the more I've worn it, the more I've been accustomed to it. I just, for my preference and my wearing styles, don't love the size 
fully. Of course, we have a very thin watch, so even depending on how you bend your wrist, it just really melts into the wrist itself, becomes really part of you. Again, there isn't any overhang on the edge of the case shape. It's kind of nearing it, but it isn't fully there. And you can see how well the bracelet actually conforms to my wrist shape. So from like an outsider's point of view, this watch does fit on my wrist. It is uh, viable, it is something I could wear, uh, but it just matters whether or not you want to kind of take that step and wear this visually because it again it is a large watch even for a 39 millimeters it gives a much larger stance than this uh, 40 millimeter watch did on my wrist even with the dial being smaller it is just a lot of metal on the watch that being said there is a double-edged sword with this watch it is comfortable because it's thin but it's uncomfortable because i think there's a little bit of unrefinement in the bottom of the case again as i mentioned there's a harshness to the bottom of the lugs to the bottom of the case and it is a very geometric harsh angle that the watch is going for but it doesn't necessarily need to go for that on the bottom side of the case you can round the edges a lot more you can try to make it a softer more smooth appearance so i guess it really kind of depends on how tight you wear your watches to me this is the setting that fits the best if i put one more link in it's too loose and slides too much but if i take uh, another link out it's basically suffocating me so at this setting depending on how i flex my wrist it does genuinely pretty much hurt even if i wear it higher up on the wrist like this depending on how much you are flexing there can be a little bit of a uh, I guess you can just say pinch or a little bit of a sharpness about the case. Here it is probably the most comfortable. Again, you're, you're not moving this high up on your wrist very often. So there is a point about that. If you don't usually wear your watches up higher, then you're pretty much set to go. And moving my watch down for reference, I do have closer to a six inch wrist here. And again, visually from the top, it doesn't look overly, overly sized. This is something you can pull off as long as you're okay with that bulkier uh, bracelet look. And something I think people will say is, well, you know, you're supposed to wear your watch up here, so you're not gonna have those wearing uh, difficulties anyway. Well, even when I do wear the watch up this high, which is something that is doable because of how tight I'm wearing this bracelet at the moment, as you walk around, as you move throughout your day, the bracelet naturally is falling a little bit down because of gravity, because of weight, because of movement. And when it falls down slightly and you move your wrist, it does dig, it does pinch, it does hurt a little bit. So again, there is refinement that can be made to this case shape that I think will just benefit the watch in general. And something I completely forgot to mention in the case portion because I was a little bit distracted by the bracelet itself, I really love this angle here of the high polish because it thins out almost completely and disappears into the middle of the case here, but it comes out, gets larger and larger until it completely cohesively and perfectly meshes with the edge of this bracelet polish. It's a really nice touch. It feels very premium. Again, just visually, it the polish leads your eye into just framing the shape very nicely and making it feel very premium. It has a glowy effect uh, uh, and it is just a very nicely executed finish. So taking a look at the loom here, and you can see that on camera it at least looks a little bit blue, whereas in person it actually is more of a green, you can see that later. Uh, but in terms of brightness, it is fairly bright. All the hands and the indices match it really well in terms of the color tone and brightness. So it isn't a bad application, it just doesn't last the longest. If we reloom it and compare it to the Timex, obviously you can see the Timex leans more blue, the Royal Oak more green, and of course the Timex is brighter, the Royal Oak doesn't have a bad application, but again, will not last you the longest and probably would die pretty soon. So starting off with pros and cons, and I think one of the biggest pros going for this watch, it is just undoubtedly an icon. There are some watches that try to imitate this look or this styling, but they do it to varying degrees of success. This is the OG in a sense. This is one of the ones that did it first. This is what broke the walls down, and it is a still very timeless and good looking design. The octagonal shape, the kind of harshness of the bracelet, the harshness of the design, but the elegance of the dial, it all works really well together and it makes sense why it is so coveted and still this popular so many years after it was introduced. I also really like this jumbo model in particular because it is one of the closest, I guess you can say, through lines to the original AP Royal Oak that was also released in 39 millimeters. So this is a very truthful, uh, interpretation of what that first Royal Oak was. You are in a sense wearing and appreciating what Gerald Genta envisioned the Royal Oak to be. My next pro for the watch will just be the finishing and mainly just the finishing on the case itself. The way the bracelet is done, the way it plays with the light, the just way it reflects at you. And honestly, just the fact that the brushed metal itself seems so shiny. It's an odd thing to say, but it really does pop out in person. The polish accents too, while not uh, stealing the show in any way, perfectly highlight 
aspects of the case, aspects of the finishing. They are a nice breakup from the fully brushed look. And I just do really appreciate how this watch comes together in person on the wrist in different lighting situations. It is just uh, one of those watches where it's almost, you're buying it more for the case than the dial. It's something that you actually really like to look at on your wrist. And <laughs> at least when I was wearing it, I very hardly looked at the dial myself. It was more about the bracelet and the case. And a very slight pro just for this newer 16202 model generation is the fact that they introduced a quick set date function to it. It's just an easy life improvement. It's nice to see AP updating things and not just kind of leaving things on the wayside and uh, resting on their laurels a bit. They are mechanically improving it a bit and that's nice to see. Moving on to cons and one of the cons and this is a little bit more specific to me and I guess just people with smaller wrists is that this 39 millimeter watch wears bigger than 39 uh, really does in any other watch. It has an integrated bracelet. It's not really a perfectly circular watch. It wears very large, it wears very flat. And uh, because of that, it takes up a lot more surface area on the wrist than a normal 40 millimeter regular lugged watch would. So on my six and a half inch wrist, I don't think this model looks very proportional. Can I get away with it if I really like the styling? Yes, but just for my taste, I didn't love how it looked on wrist. Uh, if you have a seven inch wrist, seven and a half, probably even eight inch wrist, this will look great on you. This is the sizing for you. You could probably even step up to the 41 depending on your wrist size. But this is a very classic sizing that would look good on people with larger wrists, but those with smaller wrists probably would want to check out the 37 millimeter. Another con for the watch is at least for me, it's not very comfortable on wrist. The bracelet itself can be a little bit sharp at times. It can dig into the wrist, no matter whether you wear it more on the bone or above the bone or below the bone or wherever around the bone you wear it, it does just dig as you flex your wrist, as you move it, as it kind of moves up and down throughout the day. So it isn't the most comfortable wearing experience. AP could rectify that by making it a lot more rounded on the bottom side of the bracelet. I don't think that would take away from the angularity of the top side and probably something people wouldn't see from the top side. So why not increase the comfort? Uh, but I guess to be fair, it is introducing a little bit more complication to the finishing and whatnot. So, you know, even if it ups the price, it would be worth it because it fits better. My last con, and I'll just combine two because there are fairly small issues I have with the watch. And one is the dial can be too subtle at times. To me, uh, I can't see the finishing very well. It's almost like I have to have a loop to appreciate it. And I would like to see it a little bit more in your face in a sense, or create a more intense patterning to the dial. My last little point is just the fact that the loom isn't fantastic. It does shine pretty brightly. It does shine very nicely when it is fully charged, but it doesn't last the longest. It is a fairly thin application of loom on a very thin area of the hands and the marker. So there's probably not much they can do to be fair unless they really packed the loom in there and made it a little bit more three-dimensional rising above the marker itself. And that could look cool, add a little bit more dimension to the watch. Uh, or if they just made the hands and indices bigger, they could add more loom, but I don't know if that would still jive with the design. So final thoughts on this watch, and undoubtedly it is an icon, it is a cool watch, and I enjoyed my time with it, but at the end of the day, I don't want one, or to maybe more correctly say it, I don't want this Royal Oak. To me, the Royal Oak was a watch I was never overly interested in because I'm not a big sports watch, I'm not a big bracelet person, and that's kind of the entire thing about this watch. It is a integrated sports watch, which is known for its bracelet. Uh, so it's just not really my style. I tend towards more dress watches, but uh, it, it, you can find one that just kind of grabs you. I've enjoyed my time with this watch. The more I wore it, the more I did like it, but this just is not my perfect version of a Royal Oak. I recently tried on the full gray dial. I believe it's 15450. Might be something close to that. Uh, and at 37 millimeters, with that really cool gray monotone look, I like that a lot more. And if I had to own a Royal Oak, that would probably be the one. I think this is a very just important watch in terms of watch history and it deserves its place in uh, kind of people's collections just for that in a sense. You are holding an item that really changed how watches were looked at. It changed the luxury watch industry. So I don't really think it's out of character necessarily to maybe own a Royal Oak in a sense of I look at it as a piece of functional art. Maybe I don't wear it all the time. Maybe it's not the most comfortable for me, uh, but I enjoy it because it is so historically significant and I own a piece of that. This isn't some magical unicorn watch, which is the best watch ever made and it beats everything else on planet earth. But when you've seen it in person, you can't just help but agree that the design was executed amazingly well. I enjoyed my time with the watch. It's not perfect, but I did end up liking it a lot more than I thought I would. Anyway, those are just my thoughts. Thank you as always for watching the video. Let me know what you think and I'll see you in another one.